Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Judith Fogel. I'm a Yoetzet Halakha. I have a PhD in sexology and I direct the Eden Center's class for Madrichot Kalot. And I'm an experienced college teacher myself. We're so, uh, we're so happy to be sponsoring this evening about intimacy during the times of Corona. Intimacy is a very important topic in general, especially during the times of Corona. Tonight, we will be addressing questions that I've recently received in the field. I'm hoping that the answers will illuminate questions that individuals have and not just the specific cases at hand. Let me say a little bit about the Eden Center. The Eden Center works to improve the experience of the mikvah and promote the spiritual, emotional, and physical health of Jewish women and families and provides intimacy education for different stages of marriage. We are hosting this two-part series on intimacy in the times of Corona. Tonight, we're talking about challenges in the first year of marriage. And next time, we're gonna be speaking about obstacles that arise over time. I just wanted to start with a disclaimer. The therapist that you'll be uh, introduced to tonight and be hearing from tonight um, are all in this web webinar are all from, and we'll be sh sharing suggestions in that context. With regard to personal practice, we advise you to speak to your halachic authority if you have any questions. We're also inviting you to send any comments that come up throughout this webinar, any comments that come up, send them privately to Dr. Naomi Grum, the director of the Eden Center, and she will be passing on the questions to me. At the end, we will display the panelists' phone numbers and emails, and if you would like to speak to any of the panelists further, they would be happy to do so. Um, let, me let me introduce our panelists for tonight's evening. First, we have Dr. David Ribner. He's the founder and director of the Sex Therapy, Pro uh, Therapy Training Program, School of Social Work, bar Line University in Israel, and is a certified sex therapist in Israel and the US. He is in private practice as a sex and marital therapist in Jerusalem for decades, and has authored two books on the subject, the most of which the most recent one was released this year, co-authored with Tali Rosenbaum, called I Am For My Beloved. We also have Lizzie Rubin. She's an individual, individual and couples therapist with special training in abuse, postpartum depression, pre-weds and newlyweds. And she directs the Eden Center's Mikva attending course uh, program in Israel and abroad. We also have Jody Wachpras, who is the founder of the Oasis Center and specializes in marriage and family therapy, creative arts therapy, and couples and sex therapy. So thank you to our panelists for joining. And we will begin with the case studies, uh, the cases that have come before me that I wanted to share with you. We're going to have the, uh, the therapists uh, give their comments to it. So here's the first case. Leah is in an okay relationship with her husband. They've been married for a year and she just doesn't feel any spark with him. He's a really good support system for her when it comes to her career, uh, when it comes to her career, but when it comes to just the two of them, there seems to be something missing. He seems to be a bit lethargic and dull. This is mirrored in their sex life. She doesn't seem to have the attractions for him that she had at the beginning of their relationship. Now she's stuck with home with him for months or hopefully not, I'll end soon, but for months, how can Leah negotiate her difficult situation constructively? So I wanna first open this, this case up to Dr. David Ribner. Thank you very much, Judith. And thank you all of you for participating this evening. Um, we would like to sort of give you some general guidelines before we talk to the specifics about each of these cases. And I just wanna mention a couple of points which I think will be relevant as we move along during the next hour. One is that uh, the notions of physical intimacy really take place within the context of emotional intimacy. That is, if there are, if, if there are issues which come up with regard to how a couple feels without, with, about each other physically, one of, the need, one of the places we need, first of all, to take a look at is what is the quality of their emotional connection? And have they done enough to invest in that before they begin to look at what's going on between the two of them physically? 
Secondly, uh, the word sex is going to be used for, throughout, and I think we need to be very careful about how we define that term. I think, unfortunately, uh, many people, if not most people, look at sex as being primarily directed at sexual intercourse. Uh, we would like to say to you that uh, the, the notions of sex or the notions of physical intimacy take place on a much more broadly painted spectrum. And as we move along tonight, we're going to let you know what we think about what some options may be for couples for whom actual sexual intercourse may be, during this very difficult time, somewhat problematic, but perhaps there are other kinds of physical connections they can have with each other that may be even more beneficial. Uh, and thirdly, uh, in this particular case, Leah talks about the notions of attractiveness. And I think that one of the things that may have be happening to some of us during this very difficult period, particularly if we are feeling stuck in our homes and stuck in our lives, is that we tend to, to place less, into, uh, less emphasis and our own attractiveness and how we look to our partners. Uh, it's not unusual to read on social media or to see on social media, that people are talking about just having two pairs of pajamas, a daytime pajamas and nighttime pajamas. Um, and people also are talking about, are they bathing as frequently? Are they taking as much care as they should be about their own physical hygiene? The notions of attractiveness are not only how I see my partner, it's how I would like to be perceived by my partner. I think that those kinds of focuses end up being critical with regard to how couples begin to look differently at what's going on currently in their intimate lives. Um, I'm going to stop here with regard to those general topics and allow my colleagues to look at this case and then hopefully move on to some other cases as well. Yeah, I think that, first of all, thank you, Dr. Ibner, but I, I think that when we talk about um, maintaining our own levels of attractiveness and how attractive, how attracted we are to our spouses. A lot of times that gets confusing because um, if we're not feeling so good about ourselves, a lot of times it's easier to project that on the other person. So I would encourage Leia to, um, to really take a good look in the mirror and to be a role model for her spouse, um, for her husband and do whatever she can to make herself more attractive and try to encourage him to do the same. The idea of, of him feeling lethargic and dull, I would wanna ask her, is that something new that, that relates to this specific time of Corona when they're stuck in the house? Or is that something that's already been going on for them even before this? And maybe it's just, um, you know, it, it's escalated now and we can see it a little bit more now. Lizzie, did you want to add on? <laughs> Wait, you're muted. Oh, let me unmute you. Sorry, go ahead, Lizzie. Okay. I just wanted to tell Leah that um, I was wondering, like, what are some of the strengths of her marriage and what were some of the reasons that she married him in the first place? Because she says that uh, it was okay and that she doesn't have the spark, but there must have been some reason for her to marry him that she liked and she thought that that would be good for her. And, and I would like to think that she could ex improve her communication skills with him and to talk about these things that are in her heart. I mean, she's just newly married. And I think that starting to talk about their sex life is very important in the beginning. They should decide what words they want to use together, what's comfortable for them. They should discuss what they like and what they don't like. And maybe that way it'll open up and they'll understand each other better. And I think that she could take some responsibility for the fun that she's looking for. She could also um, look for something, or, or together with him, look for, look for the good ideas that would make them have a good time together. Sometimes the couple, one is more quiet, one is more, you know, the more louder one. So maybe she could do that. Maybe she could look for something interesting. Very nice. I think we've heard, you know, one of the ideas that's important here is strengthening their communication, meaning making sure that they're both talking to each other, seeing what's difficult in their relationship, letting her express what's going on. Um, we've also heard the idea that physically, like the, the way that things look, you know, how are they dressed? What are they wearing? Are they sharing? Like those kind of ideas physically are also important. Um, and we also heard about Jody reflecting on herself, meaning like thinking about where she comes from and what's bringing on those feelings, you know, looking to the beginning of their marriage and saying, okay, why am I married to him? Like what, what was that attraction that started there? And like, what is mix, is missing now? 
So I think yeah, the coronavirus has brought out an excellent time for this specific couple because it's an excellent time for them to self-reflect about their relationship at a really important stage in their relationship. This is when they're building things. So if they can actually look and build it correctly, it's an excellent opportunity. They just have to look at it in a positive way. Also, if they've already been married for a year, they may even have their wedding album prepared and delivered so they can go back and watch their video and watch and look at their wedding album and sort of remember the spark that there was because it says that, you know, this case specifically stipulates that there was more of a spark at the beginning and and that he's a good support for her. And, and you know, so they do definitely have these pieces. So go go to the visuals, look at, you know, go take a trip down memory lane. That was excellent advice. When I have one more thing to say, <laughs> that word stuck sort of um, is, I would wonder about that word. I wondered if she, I wonder if she could use a different word instead of stuck because stuck is stuck. But maybe she could say I'm disappointed or maybe she could say I'm sad or maybe she could say I'm bored. And those are things that are easier to deal with and to find solutions for than stuck. So I would just have her downgrade it or look at it in a different way. Okay. Um, all right. Let me move on to case number two. If, unless I didn't hear anything from Naomi for any questions on that one, so let me move on to case number two. Ayala got married six months ago. She and her husband have been sexually active on a regular basis, including intercourse, but it still doesn't feel good for her. She was thinking of getting professional advice, but then Corona hit, and she doesn't feel like that is a possibility right now. She's asking if you have any tips on making sex feel better. What is she doing wrong? Um, who wants to start with that one? Uh, Lizzie, you want to take that one? Okay, so I think there's two questions here. That's one, of the, one of the things that she's asking is, what is she doing wrong? She's only married two months, okay? There's, months. there's no wrong or right, okay? She's really in the beginning of learning what's okay and what's not okay and what's good and what doesn't feel good. So I would really help her feel like, get, tell her it's okay, take your time. There's no rush, you have your whole life together to figure this out. And, um, and then I would ask her about the other thing, what does that mean that it doesn't feel good for her? What, what does she mean? I mean, um, is she saying that she, there's no pleasure? Is she saying that she doesn't have enough time to get excited? I would, you know, that's a really good area to question. What, when she says it doesn't feel good, what does she know? Does she know about orgasm? Does she know about parts of her body and parts of her husband's body? What does she know at two months? I mean, it could be that she knows a lot. It could be that we don't know who Ayala really is. But I think that, um, you know, telling her to focus on the moment and just enjoy each other and don't worry, take your time, Corona, not Corona. Spend, spend time together and learn each other's bodies. I would also ask her what, you know, if, if she's, she's, uh if she's saying that they've been sexually active on a regular basis, let's define what that means, regular basis. You know, based on, like you said, what did, where did she get her education? Where did he get his education? What does that mean, a regular basis? That's going to mean something different for every single couple and also every a lot of individuals. You know, they may have a difference of opinion. So um, if they're having sex, uh, sexual intercourse on a regular basis, what is it that's pulling her to engage in sexual intercourse or sexual relationships in, uh, activities in general on a regular basis if she's feeling a lack of pleasure. So I would try to help her identify, um, you know, well not identify, to name what she's really feeling and ask her if she's been sharing this with her, with her husband and how he's responding to it. Because there's a very good chance that if she's feeling that something is not going well um, and she's not experiencing pleasure, or she feels that something is wrong, uh, there's a really good chance that so is he. And let's try to understand where he's coming from as well. I think one of the things that we can easily tell couples, particularly couples who have at least some basis for mutual trust and acceptance, is that this is a very good time to do some body exploration with each other. And that is, uh, they need to back off a little bit, or it's advisable to back off a little bit from the frequency of their intercourse, but not necessarily frequency of other kinds of touch. Um, wherever we have skin in our bodies, we have nerve endings. Wherever there are nerve endings, you can have an enjoyable experience. I think very often people are not sufficiently tuned into 
the options of touch from head to toe, which can also prove to be very satisfying, very sensually intense, and don't necessarily lead all the time to perhaps the explosiveness of intercourse, which may not always be satisfying, but other kinds of, the, of that kind of body explanation can really contribute significantly to the sexual menu that this couple may want to build with each other during this first year of their marriage. Um, doing that, I think, you know, can be, um, and is not at all threatening, can be very mutually satisfying, and all kinds of additions can be added to that, which can make that experience uh, even more intense. For example, using a little bit of uh, body lotion or oil can make that also something that's very satisfying. So I think this is a time for that kind of mutual exploration and getting a sense of what is it that I know about my own body and what is it that I would like to know about my partner's body. Yeah, I'd like to add also the, the to just to address the fact that she's hesitant to um, to get help now, or that she feels that there's that's not a possibility. Um, it actually is a possibility if I mean maybe Ayala or someone like her is on the is on the call right now, and she feels that she's getting some of the answers. Um, but I would also tell her that she can for sure be in contact with a therapist, either with a sex therapist or with her Kala teacher, if she had a good relationship with her Kala teacher uh, or Yotzer Halacha in the neighborhood, um, you know, to, to, to speak to them. And, and Zoom sessions are not, uh, are not uh, so bad. They actually are pretty effective. Um, we're doing some surveys now, the therapist in the world of the therapist, we're doing surveys to see how effective and what the reactions are. And, and a lot of people are feeling like um, Zoom sessions are very, very effective. So I would encourage her to, to reach out and ask for some, some help, even though we're stuck at home. I think um, during the Corona time, I think it's an excellent time for not just like cleaning out your papers and your clothing and whatever you're, you know, cleaning up in your house, but also to look at the relationship. And I think, you know, it's been six months, she was thinking about going for help. And now all of a sudden she's like, wow, wait a second, let me think what I really need. And I think it's amazing that at this time, she really can contribute to her relationship. It doesn't have to be like, shoot, I'm waiting just to get to a point where, you know, things could be better and then I can take care of things but rather here's an excellent opportunity to, you know, work on these issues right now. So we have, you know, the ability of also calling a therapist if she feels that that's the necessary step, a Kala teacher. We also have the ability of her to, you know, just work with her husband on touch that's not necessarily intercourse. And also, again, thinking about what's the difficulty going on here, what's, what's actually bothering her. So I think this is an amazing opportunity that we can actually work on. Also, just to think about that, a relationship itself will also help within the bedroom so it's also important just let's say non-touch but like having dinner together and discussing things and you know building that type of relationship that's going to also help within within the bedroom okay Wait, and I, yeah i just wanted to say one more thing i find that a lot of young couples don't have an idea about the timing and that they you know sometimes i ask uh, how much time do you to get from A to Z. And they'll say something like 10, 15 minutes. And I go, what? I, I think it's very important for them to know because I'm not sure that they have any place of, to get that information, that it takes time. She's saying that she doesn't feel good. Maybe she just needs more time. Maybe she needs to know that she needs more time to be together till she feels a lot of pleasure. So. So you're saying like timing in general or like timing within foreplay, like a little bit more time at foreplay, warming up before intercourse or just like- right, time and for, I'm saying more time in foreplay because I don't, you know, I, I found that many people do not give enough time for that. I want to also add in here, um, you know, the question of how we define foreplay. I'm very into definition. Um, foreplay is generally associated with what comes before the warm up, what comes before penetration. And um, female um, orgasm does not have to come before penetration. Arousal needs to come before penetration. Some sort of arousal does because then it feels better and it's more comfortable, but actual orgasm does not have to come before penetration. And that's okay too. Uh, it's not just okay, it's totally, totally normal. And I, I think that it's really important to normalize that, that um, even after um, intercourse, 
it doesn't mean that everything is is over and done with. She still has opportunity to experience pleasure, and he should be encouraged to um, to help her out with that as well. Any other questions? Okay, let's go on to our next case. Um, Javi. Okay, Javi got married two months ago, and she's still not able to have full penetration. She went to a doctor who diagnosed her with vaginismus and was referred to a pelvic floor therapist. Because of the timing, coronavirus and all, Javi has not yet been able to make an appointment. She's not sure how long it will take to solve her issue. Javi feels really guilty since she knows she's preventing her husband from having sex, or at least as she says it in the case. She avoids any type of intimate behavior because she's afraid of what it might lead to. She's asking for guidance to help her through the next few months until she works on the vaginismus. I just want to want can someone first before we even go into the to the um, to the case itself just to find vaginismus for those people who don't know what it is. Dr. Mm -hmm. Lizzie. Lizzie. <laughs> okay, so when a woman's uh, vaginal muscles, uh, pelvic muscles tighten up and it doesn't allow for penetration, and the man will say something like, I feel like I'm hitting against a brick wall. And uh, sometimes it's, and it can be very, very painful. It is very painful for penetration to occur. Um, sometimes it comes, you know, from, a, from an emotional reason, like the person is saying, Yes, I want this, but the body says no, and they just has no control over the over the muscles. And a pelvic floor therapist will will teach her how to relax those muscles and allow for dilators to go in, so that afterwards uh, she can have normal intercourse. Okay, I think also uh, we had a whoever has seen unorthodox. Um, I saw that the Eden Center posted a a, a blog about it today or yesterday, uh, whoever's seen Unorthodox, there is one of the episodes talks about, um, I think her name is Esti, not Ruhami, it's Esti in Unorthodox. Um, <laughs> and she has trouble with penetration. She and, and her husband and Yaka Yanki have trouble with penetration. There's a piece of the of one of the episodes that talks about that her college teacher comes and talks to her about dilators. Um, let's not accept Unorthodox as a uh, the way that we really try to do things and try to help women. Um, but vaginismus is something that's, that's very common, especially amongst, um, you know, young, um, not just young, but early, uh, early marrieds. Doesn't really matter how old you are, but when you're first learning how to have um, sexual, um, sexual intercourse and to be sexual and to identify with yourself as a sexual woman, um, vaginismus is something that's that's pretty pretty common, and we have to be able to learn that it's okay to feel a certain amount of tension, and then how we can um, how we can control the tension of those muscles. And pelvic floor uh, physical therapy is an excellent way to to, to do that, um, together with very often sex therapy, uh, because it's a combination of physical and, and, uh, and emotional and relational. So I have so many things I want to say to Javi. This case is like, is like chock full of so many different things. The first thing I want, want to say to Javi is it's not only your problem. She, you know, there are so many places in this little um, case uh, presentation where she's taking the blame. She's saying, um, how long will it take to solve you know, her issue. She feels guilty about preventing him from being able to experience, um, sec well, penetration or sexual pleasure. That's not very clear. She feels guilty about the fact that it's taking so long. You know, I want to just say, Javi, it's, you know, it's okay. You've been married for two months. You're already on top of it. You're already recognizing that there is an issue and you want to take care of it. So you already get a gold star. So that's the first thing I want to say to her. Um, the timing, yeah, it stinks. The you know this coronavirus did not schedule itself very well with any of us, and definitely is not helpful to Javi and her husband. Um, guilt, though, is something that can sometimes come to sort of like signal that we need to do something, and then that okay, thank you. But when it changes and when it when it sort of um, evolves into shame, and she starts taking. Um, responsibility, she starts feeling that there's something wrong with her, then I already want to help her try to move away from that because this is not, 
um, something that I, that needs to identify her in general. Um, so, so that that that's one thing. Um, uh, I'd like to encourage her to reach out. Um, there are some pelvic floor physical therapists that will be happy to have some conversation with her on the phone and to give her some exercises. I don't, I don't know. That's very, that's very case specific. Um, and then I'd like to help her identify um, what, if she's feeling, um, if, if she's, what kind of pain she's feeling, who gave her the diagnosis. And if she's discussing this with her husband, because just like in the case before, there's a lot of give and take when it comes to sexual relationships. And if she's feeling jet vaginismus, I'd like to hear what he's, what he's feeling. Um, I would want to ask her, what are her I am statements? You know, is she telling herself I am a disappointment or is she telling herself I'm struggling? Uh, is, is she telling herself, I'm a loving wife, I'm a dedicated wife, I am a, you know, I'm someone that, that's proactive and is trying to help myself. Um, and then I would talk to her a little bit about, um, about her avoidance, you know, that she's sort of avoiding any type of, did we say that? Was that part of what, what, what you said, Judith? Yeah, she's <laughs> avoiding any she's intimate. avoiding any type of. Yeah, yeah. she's totally avoiding it because she's so, just afraid. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. She's afraid of the pain. So let's try to identify the difference between pain and int in intimacy, because there's a lot of possibility, like Dr. Ribner said at the beginning of this, of this uh, webinar, there's a lot of areas, a lot of sexual intimacy that can be achieved without penetration. And those can be a lot of fun and they can be very act even relaxing. So I would, I would ask her how she feels about doing some um, body exploration and maybe even saying, you know, penetration right now is, is painful and we don't want to have pain when, we're, when we want to be developing a healthy sexual relationship. What can we do without that being a component? What can we do that will help, you know, us be able to explore our sexuality and our emotional intimacy um, that takes the pain out of the equation right now. Excellent. I just want to add a couple of points here. One is that I uh, concur that there are uh, various kinds of vaginal pain and I would not be so quick to assume that the doctor that you went to is, is a yeah. professional in, uh, in this particular area and would question it in terms of whether or not this is a correct diagnosis an incorrect diagnosis will lead to an incorrect treatment and just make things worse. I think also there's a room here to look at it from the husband's perspective in the sense that he probably has no idea about what kinds of vaginal pain they are and what it really feels like, what it means to a woman to go through this. And I think for him with her, there's room here for a lot of sexual education uh, provided by sex therapists. I think that would be highly recommended in this situation. His understanding of this may make the entire process for her much, much easier and go along with allowing them to consider alternate kinds of intimacy before they even get to, before they even get to intercourse. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the things that I was uh, alerted to here is when she says she avoids any kind of intimate behavior because she is afraid of what it might lead to, I don't think that she's only concerned about that it may lead to her own vaginal pain. I think she's concerned about it, what it may lead to in terms of unduly arousing her husband and he will not be able to complete uh, sexual intercourse by having ejaculation inside of her. I think she might also be very concerned about that if in fact she's gone through a, uh, an educational curriculum in her life that, that uh, forces her to be very concerned about that. I think someone needs to speak to both of them about that and see whether or not there's a place they can find comfortable for the two of them at this stage in their life. Um. And I'd like to add, um, I'd like to add that there is also, I like to tell these women that there is light at the end of the tunnel and it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of love, but that most 99%, I heard a physical therapist tell me this, that 99, or even doctors will say 99% really get, get you know, taken care of and it's okay. It just takes a lot. It could take time and there are groups and you're probably online groups of women that could talk about it together. People share information and people, um, it's also good to talk to another woman about it. It's going through the same thing. I find that support groups really do just that is uh, make it easier to go through. Of course, 
you know, for the husband as well to get, maybe there are groups for men, um, but I think that uh, getting s support from another person who went through it is, is extremely helpful. Excellent. Um, I think that that's great advice uh, for Javi. Um, so hopefully she has been listening and uh, um, will able to will be able to get the, the help that she needs. Um, I just want to throw in a question that came up from the audience, just to throw that in. So um, here's one that just came up. I would like to know if the panelists feel that maybe perhaps marriages should be put on hold now. In real life, there's a healthy element to an intimate life when couples are not together all day. Now they are together so much that the bedroom life can be affected. If couples who got married a few weeks ago are struggling with intimacy more than usual, should weddings can be put on hold until the situation stabilizes? Does anyone want to tackle that one? Great question. It is a great question. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a generic answer that we can give for that. It very much depends on the quality of the relationship that currently exists for this couple. Uh, the kind of circumstance they'll be living in once the marriage is over, once the wedding is over. Uh, I think all that needs to be talked about. Uh, whether or not we would advise them to postpone a wedding becomes very much problematic since we have absolutely no idea how long the situation is going to take. And there's always a risk that if we postpone the wedding too long, something will occur that will disrupt their relationship and the wedding perhaps may not in fact take place. I think that's a real risk here. So again, a couple needs to be spoken with in terms of where they are at this moment in their lives. But I think that um, in general, in terms of our own philosophy, we try as much as possible not to postpone weddings. And I think that I would rather see if, if it's viable at all to have this wedding happen and then do so with as much support as this couple's need to get through this initial stage of their, of their relationship with each other. Yeah. I would totally agree with everything that you just said. And, um, you know, there's there are a lot of issues that are that are coming up right now with with um, with weddings and, you know, your dream wedding and your dream wedding night um, and your dream mikveh experience. I know that, you know, there are kalot that I work with that, you know, we are the kala education, the kala t like teaching them is is different now. And it's really, really important to recognize that this is going to end. Like Lizzie said, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. It's a little bit hard to see when it's going to when it's going to come, uh, when it's going to happen. Um, and that this is a piece of your relationship. And it is. I think it's a good question that that that, that this person wrote in because we don't know, you know, how much of your relationship this is going to be and your wedding time period, like when you're first getting married and married um, is something that you hold on to very closely. It becomes something that is, is ingrained in your, in your hearts and in your memories. And you want to ask yourself, how do you want to look back on this experience? I think people are saying that in general, right? Like how do you, in 10 years from now or 20 years from now, you're telling your children, your grandchildren, you know, you know how it was when the coronavirus hit the world. Um, how do you want to Think about it. Who do you want to be? What do you want to represent? And and how do you, does that represent what you want for your marriage? And you have to be honest with yourselves. I think also just as being a college teacher and dealing with a lot of color now who are making this decision. Um, first of all, Jody, exactly what you said. A lot of color a lot of times picture their wedding night in this like hotel and everything like that. And during Corona, they, they're not going back to any hotels. They are going back to their apartment. Um, so it is a big decision, but I think that some of the things we have to think about is the engagement time. That if you're pushing off getting married, you're extending the engagement time, which is so stressful, especially like, I don't know if they're being shomani gear or not being shomani gear, you know, touching beforehand or not. Like, there's a lot going on to this question that basically sometimes prolonging a wedding um, when the couple is ready to get married just because uh, they're afraid of what's going to be afterwards is I'm not sure always the best decision. Now, it depends why they're afraid of what's going on afterwards. But I really think that they should really think about how much they want to um, extend that engagement time, especially not knowing if there's going to be an end to that. Um, I just, yeah, go ahead. I just uh, I wanted to say that I think it's really up to the couple to decide together what they should do. You know, in, with Corona, I don't know about you guys, but there's a certain level of anxiety that, you know, we're at a much higher level than we usually are. 
And I can see a young girl saying, I'm just too nervous. I'm anxious. I guess I know that I, you know, we're not supposed to push off weddings. And I know that I, I care for you and I love, love you and I want to marry you. But I can see well, both sides feeling very anxious and say, you know, we want to get married feeling that we're past this and that we can enjoy ourselves. And, and I really think it's the couple's decision. If they're ready to get married, they're ready to figure out this too. Um, so I would, you know, with some guidance, leave it to them. I think it's their decision to uh, push it off. We're not talking about a long time. We're talking about, you know, hopefully weeks or months, uh, which is not easy. I agree with you. It's not easy. It's, it's not very easy. Easy. We all hope that it ends shortly and it won't be for a couple of months. Right. Right. Um, I just want to bring in another uh, question that just stemmed from that. It said, so do you think that couples can't get bored being together too much? Or can some harm happen to their intimate relationship if they're together too much at the beginning? <laughs> that's good. I think that's going to come up in some of the questions that we have already, um, the cases that we, we're going to be discussing. Um, anything can be integrated into our relationship in, in, in a positive way and in a negative way. Too much of a good thing can be hard for some people and other people are relishing, are just like enjoying having so much of a good thing. It's all perspective. And at the same time, um, I, I would also tell them, you know, make sure that you give each other some space. You know, like uh, it is fun to be together. It is great to be together, but sometimes, you know, we need that time to, to do things that are important to us and to give, and I think that respect of giving each other space makes Corona for any marriage uh, much more yeah, easier to go through this difficult time when you, uh, you I think also we need to realize that there's no precedent for the situation. Right. In other words, in many life situations, we have some preparatory experiences that allow us to at least ease into that, even if it may not be entirely recognizable to us. This is a new, new territory for everybody, for newlyweds, for people who've married for 10 years, for those of us who've married for 40 or 50 years. Um, and so we are all experiencing this as something which needs to be confronted with the best of our intentions and the best of our goodwill. Um, I think there are some qualities to this that are sort of baseline, which everyone needs to have a sense of, which is sense of mutual respect, of mutual acceptance, of making sure that you're as polite and as sensitive to each other as possible, uh, making sure that you are confronting each day with a sense of humor and a capacity to be as flexible as each one can be. I think those will all contribute to allowing this to be a survivable experience, knowing full well that all of us have limits and all of us have moments which are going to be difficult. Um, but I don't think it's an inherently negative experience if couples do confront it with the notion of, uh, yes, we're in this together, unless, yes, we can survive this together. And, and I think, you know, as my colleagues have said, there are various aspects of this in terms of giving space and giving understanding and giving time. I think all of those are going to be part of the general picture here. But I think the picture here can be conceived as one that is more positive than negative, assuming that the baseline relationship is a positive one. We can also pretend, we can throw in a little role play and we could pretend, you know, do the high home, even if you've been home together the whole day, you know, at a certain point, it's like six o'clock is maybe when you would like normally on, you know, be coming home or 6.30 or whatever it is. And then you just sort of like go in the other room and, and knock on the door and open up and say, hi, honey, I'm home. How has your day been? And, or, you know, how was your day at work? I was, and just pre share something new, share, like pretend a little bit. It's fun. <laughs> Sounds great. And I think everyone can take out the garbage by themselves, you know, a couple <laughs> minutes by themselves is totally fine. Um, really important. Okay. And also now they're running, they're allowing, you know, two runners to go 500 meters. So, you know, you can take your space and do something outside a little bit. Um, okay. I'm going to read the next case. Josh called me up this week. His wife, Rachel, is really concerned about going to mikvah. She hasn't left the house in a month, not even for the supermarket or the pharmacy. I'm just laugh I'm like, like smiling, not in a, you know, whatever, but I've been getting this question so many times. It's just hard to even hear this. She's heard the virus is not transmitted in the mikvah and all the services are clean between Tovlo. 
She, however, still feels weary. She was so concerned that she, that she doubled up her birth control pills to skip her period altogether. She started bleeding anyway. She's supposed to go to the mikvah tomorrow night and she just doesn't see herself going. As her husband, I don't know what my role should be. I clearly want her to go, but how much should I push? Also, even if she does go, I know that she won't be in the mindset for intimacy. What do I do? How can I get her into the mindset? Such a question. Um, I think, first of all, you know, we're confronting a situation here where the husband, as husbands tend to do, is trying to use logic to deal with the situation <laughs> in which his wife is responding in, a, in an emotional manner. And that's never a good mix. And so I think one thing that uh, this young man needs to be told is that you can explain this for the next 24 hours and, you know, have 57 uh, scholarly articles which support your position and that will not help at all. Okay, he needs to recognize that if there is really a sense of trepidation on his wife's part, then that needs to be honored. And she should not, in, under any circumstances, be forced to go into a situation in which it's, uh, in which it's just going to be totally fearful for her. That will not help her, her, will not help him, and will certainly not help their relationship, either emotional or physical. Uh, there is room here for some education, for some knowledge, for some understanding exactly what goes on in the mikvah in terms of how they keep it clean, exactly what goes on in terms of how this virus is transmitted. Is there any risk at all? Is there a minimum risk? Uh, but I think ultimately it's not his decision, it's her decision. And he needs to be the one to be supportive in this situation in terms of allowing her not to be, not to feel that she's being forced into a situation which is totally incomprehensible to her. Um, and that goes to you know what he says also of getting her into a mindset. I would really like to know about what was mikvah night like for this couple before Corona started. You know, was that stressful for them then? Was it uh, enjoyable? Was it a night that they both celebrated in some way? Um, did he have some part in making sure that the house was put together before she came home? Did she have some sense in making sure that she was diligent about it, but in terms of time and making sure that she got to the mikvah when she should get there? Did she walk in the house with a smile? Did he greet her with a smile? But that's been their history. And we know that there's some significant basis for them to maintain some level of that relationship as they move on during this. And again, we're, we're confronted here by a time factor, which is how long is this all going to last? I appreciate people's sense of um, positive perspective on what the future may hold, but I don't think that we can, be, we can count on that. I mean, we're talking about one more mikvah or two more mikvot, or we're talking about another four months Honestly, no one has, no, none of us has any knowledge about this. The situation may, may remain stagnant as it is now for a significant period of time. And what does that mean in terms of, is she going to continue to have this level of trepidation? I would say that she would uh, benefit tremendously by some conversations with someone who could, was a self professional helper who can deal with what, was, what may be more or less rational aspects of her trepidation. And her husband needs to realize that this is a long-term relationship. The fact that she may not go for the next amount of time does not mean that they will never have a significant sex life in the future. And that just as there are periods of time during a couple's life where sex is not available to them, touch is not available to them. For example, the times right after childbirth, this may be a similar kind of time. If they've never had children yet, then this is something that they will have to confront in the future. Unfortunately, they're confronting it now but it's something that is, is workable, assuming that their basis is a strong one. Yeah, I mean, we're already in the second month for a lot of women. There are already women that have had to go to the mikvah two times in the, you know, in this corona reality. And, and we're seeing that, you know, we're all going through the different phases of, of, of grief and, in you know, the denial and, you know, all the way to acceptance at different times. And a lot of times we're bouncing back and forth between like we get to acceptance and all of a sudden we're faced with something different and we th get thrown back into anger. I know that's happened to me. Um, so it, it can be very confusing and opening the conversation between the two of them is going to be really important. I agree no one can convince anyone else to do something. And that's an important lesson for relationships and marriages um, specifically. Um, but this, this may not, this, this may be an issue that, that, um, that comes up for a while. And it, and it could also be what, you know, when it comes to making decisions about 
where both of you are involved, but it may be, it's a little, it's more al-Bsara, right? It's more, she's the one that has to go to the mikvah. She's the one with the fear. Um, you know, I, that would be something that I would encourage them to, to talk about also and to respect. I don't want to take away from her anxiety or her fear at all. And I think that it's really important to hold that in its place. I just want to put in another piece here just to make sure that um, the mikvah out right now, just as they are. And I think we, we've had a webinar beforehand, so it's going to just be very short. But the mikvah out, especially, um, they've been given um, they've been given the instruction to make sure to clean in between each and every tovelet. They um, have been making appointments. And I really, first of all, I think it's important that every woman and check with her mikvah in her area and make sure that they're following by those standards. Um, but those people who are don't have that anxiety, don't have that fear, realize that the mikvah is really, um, it's not transmitted in the water and it really can be a fine experience uh, going to the mikvah nowadays. So it's, it, it is, uh, if you make sure that your mikvah is following up to standard, it can be, uh, uh, the risk can be very, very relatively low in those mikvahs. One of the things I love saying to Tovlo, it actually gives me peace of mind also when I get volunteered our mikvah and I see Sarah Greenberg is here. She's a Yotzer Halakha and Modi'in and we're working really hard to make sure that the iria stays on top of everything and lets the women know what's going on. Um, but one of my favorite things of this whole, this whole time and being involved in mikvah and Tarada Mishpacha is when I can say to a woman when she's about to go in, I can say, when you are in the water, take your time. You're in the safest place you can be. The water of the mikvah is taken care of. It's and and I can I can say that about the mikvah that I'm working in, and assure her that this is an experience that you can actually let your guard. It's going to make me cry a little bit. Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting emotional, but it is one the place where you can just say I'm okay right now, and really take that deep breath. And, and be able to feel the mikvah experience in, in, a, in a way that you may not feel on a, on a, you know, in a different circumstance. Also, there are analogous experiences like this that people may have in their lives. Uh, extended business trips, uh, extended illnesses, uh, uh, bleeding that can't be stopped for some yeah. reason or another. I mean, this is not necessarily unique to this corona period, but there may be two or three or four mikvahs that people go through before Tavila is possible. I think that piece of reality needs to be placed in front of this couple and say, look, this sometimes happens in people's lives. We're sorry it's happening to you right now, but everyone will do their best to make sure that you can get through this in a manner that uh, does not do any harm to your relationship. And in fact, looking back on it, you may feel very good about each other and that you were mutually supportive and were able to talk to each other and were able to conduct your lives in a manner that maintains your emotional intimacy, even if you could not at this point be involved in your physical intimacy. I think speaking to the husband, I would I would tell the husband, you know, you you obviously cannot force anybody to to do anything that they don't want to do. But I think there are ways to to give the woman the choice and say, listen, if you go there, you could see if they're doing the guidelines. That might help or it might not. You know, she's obviously very anxious, but just giving her all sorts of possibilities, like if you. And if you go, well, we don't have to do anything. We can just touch, we can just hug. Like just opening up the scenario instead of it just being going to the mikvah and, and having sex afterwards, it could like open it up to, well, what do you think of the possibilities of us just, if you go, if it's safe and we can just be together and, and uh, touch and no pressure. And no pressure on anything. I, I think that his, the way he says it is, um, is very important. Okay, um, I want to go on to the next case. Um, Devora is newly married. She is thankful for the opportunity the quarantine has, is providing, or not just quarantine, yeah, the quarantine is providing in terms of amazing alone time for her and her chatan. In addition to her emotional connection she is working on with him, Devora is just starting to really enjoy their physical relationship. Devorah is asking if there are any tips or ideas of what she could do with her husband in all of this alone time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll jump in. Um, like I said before, I think, you know, communication, sexual communication is, you know, something that a couple has to develop. She's just newly married and um, 
And I think they need to talk about so things like, well, what makes you feel good? And what, what makes me feel good? And what are you in the mood for? What are you not in the mood for? Um, I think that there are all kinds of ideas that people come up with, with according to their personalities. I just had a couple that said to me that they made a blanket fort in their living room and put their computer inside and, and watched or there are couples that write are really good writers and they write each other stories, you know, and surprise them with stories. I think there's a lot of things a person could do. You could, uh, there's role plays. They could play games such as I'll be the bus driver. You be the, you be the person that gets on the bus and, and let's see what happens. There, there are just, you know, endless things to do to just have a good time. I think, um, it's about having a sense of humor and playing together. And like I said before, making space as well. Like there's time together and there's time that we need for our own things. And one more thing is fantasies. Many times people think, um, have fantasies, but no one wants to talk about it. But with your spouse, if you learn to be able to talk about your fantasies, you can have a very good time. So those are my tips to young couples. Uh, it really is, a, according to their personality, what they're good at and cooking together, baking together, especially in Corona. These are things that, you know, we can do in the house. That, uh, yeah. Like yeah, sensuality can come in so many different forms. And, uh, you know, we were talking before about, you know, about, Lizzie, what you just said about baking together. You, know, you can learn so much about what kind of touch you like and what type of touch your partner likes by, I mean, this may sound funny, but by baking challah together, you know, when you're kneading the dough, when you're trying to like, see like, okay, I like to knead really, you know, to push really hard and to push my fingers really hard because that's what you know, I, I, I feel the dough and, and, oh, but I love it when I add a little bit of oil, you know, to my hands and it's nice and smooth and it's nice and soft. And, um, you know, it can be, you can learn so much about what kind of touch you enjoy by, um, by baking together, by eating food together. What kind of flavors do you like? What does it feel like in your mouth? Try to, you know, they try to experience things from with all of your senses, um, and really appreciate everything that's going on because you can be, you can learn so much when you're intentional. Like when you say, okay, now we're gonna focus only in our sense of smell, right? And what does that bring up? Now we're gonna focus, oh, you know, we're gonna uh, put on blindfolds and see what we hear and what we, you know, and now we're gonna put in, you know, earplugs and we're gonna see, and you can really play around and have a really good time at learning things about one another and learning things about yourself that you wouldn't have known otherwise. Now, what I'm going to suggest here may not seem to be quite in the same realm as my colleagues, but um, <laughs> for some couples, I think learning together becomes very much of an emotionally uh, an intimate experience. Uh, not many couples do that. And I think that the sense of sharing that kind of back and forth, particularly if what they're learning has some emotional content to it, sheer sheer, for example, can also be very much of, a, um, of an emotionally uh, sensitive experience for the two of them. I also want to mention that uh, we're sort of almost out of time now, but if anyone wants to call any of us with regard to much more specific suggestions about what couples can do with each other, if they want to add some an additional element, spice up their intimate life, uh, we'd be happy to do that. It's easy to do that if we're able to get to know the couple a little bit, know where they are in their lives, and then be able to make suggestions based on moving them in that direction. There you go. Um, yeah, I think it's important to know that all of the speakers here um, can, be re can be reached. Their phone numbers are on the screen right now, as you see. Uh, their email addresses, if anyone wants to set up an appointment or have any questions, um, they, could, they are open also for a discussion. If anyone wants to call them to have a 15-minute initial conversation with one of the speakers to see if it's important to, uh, uh, to move the questions further, they're, they're open to that, so feel free. Um, okay, is there any last minute end words that uh, people wanted to share with us? One, second. One thing I'll say is that the initial stage of marriage is not limited to 12 months. Uh, shown and shown as a concept can be six months or it can be 18 months. Uh, it's the time that people are trying to get to know each other in many, many ways in their lives. 
And doing so in, this, in the context of this corona certainly is much more complex, but it's the same kinds of tasks that people have to have been living with since time immemorial, our parents, our grandparents, and going back to you know, 2000 years. So I think that you know, people need to have a sense of what are the realistic barriers that are here and do they really represent something that's entirely new or are they going through the stages that most couples will go through as well? And secondly, help is available. I think my colleagues have mentioned that before. Please feel free, talk to people you think are expert in this. Uh, we caution you not to talk about people who are not expert in this. Uh, you will only be making yourselves frequently uh, feeling much worse about a situation. But feel free to call people, be in touch with people who are sexual health professionals, who are madrichim and madrichot, who have really learned that craft in a manner that perhaps was not done a generation ago. And uh, there's nothing that any client, any couple is going to say to any of us that we haven't heard a thousand times. So we will be happy to do whatever we can to make sure that we can all survive this period with not only the least amount of stress, but the maximum amount of personal and development as a couple as well. Yeah, I like to say that, you know, like you said, there's so many things that, you know, you know, we say no one can surprise us with anything. I like to tell clients and to tell anyone that I speak to that, you know, your case may not be unique, but it's still special, right? It's still about who you are and what you bring to it. So in terms of, of the discomfort of talking about your sexuality with someone, that makes sense because we don't generally talk about our sexuality so openly with other people. But when you're going to be speaking to someone and reaching out to someone who's in the field, who's been trained, like Dr. Ibner said, you can rest assured that for us, it's comfortable. And, and, and we're, we're great with talking about this kind of stuff with you and that we can really, you know, we can really help you understand what, you know, what you're going through. And I'm, I'd like to also just thank Nomi and the Eden Center. Oh boy giving us this forum. I don't, you know, being able to talk about these things on a Zoom session is like a, a new idea. I don't think 10 years ago, five years ago or, or whatever, people would talk like this, but I, I find that it's so important that this generation needs openness and needs to know information and needs to get help if there's anything. It, it's, a, it's not easy to, you know, things are, things are more complicated today than they were, especially with Corona, but just, um, it's, it's just a, a real schut to, to be able to get up here and to be able to open up these topics and, and offer you some help and offer you the, the ability to talk about things in an open way. Because in my days, forget it, nobody asked any questions. Um, and I thank Nomi for doing that and Judith and everybody. I think it was, you know. Um, I also, I just wanted to reiterate something that I said in the beginning that I think it's really, you know, even though it's hard and difficult at times, I think it's an excellent opportunity to look inside our relationships and to think about what's going on both physically, both emotionally, and if possible, to really just seize the time to make it possible uh, uh, to work on those things. Um, so I would also, um, I would also want to thank our speakers for all of their time tonight. Um, really, it is not, you know, as they say, Muvan may love that we have three excellent sex therapists who are up here giving of their time and um, and their expertise, telling us ideas um, and what to do. We have a lot of experiences and ideas and suggestions, which we hope will be helpful that we've learned tonight. We want to remind everyone that there's no such thing as a one size fits all solution, um, and those. Those individuals or couples are not alone and encouraged to seek assistance from the professionals when the situation warrants regardless. Um, just to remind everyone, you are not alone. We've all had challenges and have come out stronger because of them. We wish everyone continued health and look forward, you, forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you Bye. again to the Heaven Center.